I am essentially a static, contemplative and objective person, almost a hermit in daily life, and always preferring to observe rather than participate. My only natural and genuine form of imagination is that of passive witnessing, the idea of being that sort of um, disembodied floating eye which sees all manner of marvelous phenomena without being greatly affected by them. I should describe my own nature as tripartite, my interests consisting of three parallel and disassociated groups. A. Love of the strange and the fantastic. B. Love of the abstract truth and of scientific logic. C. Love of the ancient and the permanent. Sundry combinations of these three strains will probably account for my odd tastes and eccentricities. I could never write about ordinary people because I'm not in the least interested in them. And without interest, there can be no art. Man's relation to man does not captivate my fancy. It is man's relation to the cosmos, to the unknown, which alone arouses in me the spark of creative imagination. non-human word. The name of the hellish entity was invented by beings whose vocal organs were not like man's. The syllables were determined by a physiological equipment wholly unlike ours, hence could never be uttered perfectly by human throats. The actual sound, as nearly as human organs could imitate it, could be taken something as... The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy. Such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force, and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. The thing of the idols, the green sticky spawn of the stars was awaked to claim his own. The stars were right again, and what an age-old cult had failed to do by design, a band of innocent sailors had done by accident. After vigintillions of years, the great Cthulhu 
was loose again and ravening for delight. Three men were swept up by the flabby claws before anybody turned. God rest them, if there be any rest in the universe. What do you know about George Angel? This is the first I've heard of him. You're in for a treat. First, your uncle disappears. No death certificate, no records. Then we had to keep tabs on you since the day you were born. Why the wait? Your uncle's instructions were specific. The said box shall be sealed and shall be given on the day of his 27th birthday to the one will have been born on the summer solstice of 1970. That's you. Summer solstice? So he didn't even know me. From what I hear, that wouldn't have mattered to your uncle. There you are. That's it. By the way, Mr. Carter, your uncle also stipulates here that the box be open only when you're alone. Haven't seen you around the store in a while. Uh, I've been really busy. Uh -huh. Sold anything lately? <laughs> right. Still broke. What's in the box? It's a present. I just inherited from an uncle I never even heard of. It's been sitting around in some lawyer's office for almost 30 years. Uh, you're joking. Well, maybe you're not so broke after all. Well, what's keeping you? Open it. I don't know. I got this weird feeling that I've seen this box before. I'm just scared of what I'm going to find. Whatever. Hey, don't! I gotta go. See ya.
Professor Henry Armitage. either the oldest or the last of Earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. Not in the spaces we know, but between them, they walk serene and primal, undimensioned, and to us, unseen. Angel? George! Blake? Oh, come on, old man! It's Harley! Harley Warren! What's going on? <sighs> you saved my life! It's Maple now. A little better than that bit of fence post you tacked on at Verdun. Not that I'm not grateful. None of those bloody rumors for me. Blake, what are you talking about? You know, some of the men were a little leery. All that Dr. Stump stuff, too many amputations. <laughs> Ungrateful punks. What? Say, you can help. You remember my brother. You don't have a brother. You wouldn't believe what he's gotten up to. You are just the man. I'm sure he's not too far gone to listen to George Angel. Follow me. Two years ago, he ran across fragments of this damn book. He quit everything to do some fundamental research, as he says. Go on, go on. Your brother has also mistaken me for him. What brother? Have you lost your mind? You know I never had a brother. Wait here. I have something to show you. Get back, you stupid thing! I've almost succeeded, George! But I could use your help! 
remember the book, the Necronomicon, it can keep these creatures alive. And I know where to find it. Did you sculpt that? Can flesh be sculpted? I can't be alive. Not yet, George. Not yet. Keep your eyes on the curtain, George. Watch the curtain. Who's that guy? Lovecraft. He's a writer. The owner here is crazy about the guy. We've got tons of Lovecraft stuff. It's on sale, too. T-shirts are $25. No, thanks. Guess that inheritance kind of fizzled, huh? So what was in the box? A set of cufflinks? Have you read his books? Who? Lovecraft? No, no, it's not my speed. I saw one of his movies once. It wasn't very good. What was it about? I don't know. Hairy squids from outer space. Is Lovecraft still alive? I have no idea. I just work here. Here, since you're so interested. Come on. This is supposed to be one of his best. We can just bring it back whenever you want. This you can keep. They're not selling anyways. So, what was in the box? Uh, just an old book. Seven. I used to be tormented constantly by a peculiar form of recurrent nightmare in which a monstrous race of entities, called by me 
the Night Gaunts. I don't know where I got hold of that name. They used to snatch me up by the stomach, probably in digestion, and carry me off through infinite leagues of black air over the towers of dead and horrible cities. And they would finally get me into a gray void where I could see the needle-like pinnacles of enormous mountains miles below. The night gaunts were black, lean, rubbery things with, with horns and barbed tails, bat wings, and no faces at all. American author of fantastic and macabre short novels and stories, one of the 20th century masters of the gothic tale of terror. H.P. Lovecraft was a precocious youth. He was reciting poetry at age two and reading at age three. He was also interested in science from childhood, but poor health prevented him from attending college. He spent most of his life in Providence, where he made his living as a ghostwriter and rewrite man. He lived a solitary life, but kept up a voluminous correspondence, writing over a hundred thousand letters, of which some twenty thousand have been saved. From 1923 on, most of Lovecraft's short stories appeared in the magazine Weird Tales. His Cthulhu Mythos series of tales describe ordinary New Englanders' encounters with horrific beings of extraterrestrial origin. Many references are made in his stories to an imaginary book the Necronomicon, an encyclopedia of evil compiled by mad Arab poet Abdul Alhazred. Lovecraft was a master of poetic language, and he attained unusually high literary standards in his particular fictional genre. His fame as a writer increased after his death. Necronomicon. Henry Armitage. That was such a long time ago. <laughs> you look very much like him. For a moment, I thought he'd come back from the dead. Uh, did you know my uncle well? Oh, yes. He was a brilliant man. He taught me anthropology at Miskatonic University. At the time, I was your age and <laughs> he was mine. He, uh, left me this book. Mr. Carter, have you read this book? Well, yeah. I leafed through it a bit. Have you spoken any of its contents aloud? Why? Legend has it that some of the words can act as keys which open invisible doors. Doors which cross the wall of sleep. The Necronomicon so known as Al-Azif, the Howling of Devils. Some say it doesn't exist. But your uncle strongly believed that it did exist and that at the hands of certain individuals, it can become a potent tool. 
He believed H.P. Lovecraft was such a person. I've never really known, Mr. Carter. How did your uncle die? His body was never found. I sometimes believe he finally succeeded in proving his theory. What do you mean? Well, the book suggests some repulsive things. Well, shortly after Abdul al-Hazred finished writing the Necronomicon in 738 AD, he is said to have been seized by an invisible monster and devoured in broad daylight before a terrified mob. You believe my uncle was devoured by an invisible monster? I don't believe anything, Mr. Carter. But there are some phenomena which are impossible to explain. I knew a man who dreamt every night that he was falling. One morning, he was found dead in his bed. All his bones were shattered. And in 1963, another man attempted to steal a gargoyle from an English cathedral. He was found dead, disemboweled at the foot of the gargoyle, whose jaws, of course, were stained with his blood. I know dozens of such stories, Mr. Carter. All of them true, and all of them unexplainable. Professor, have you ever heard of a man named Harley Warren? How do you know about Warren? Somehow, I met him last night. Young man, what have you done? Harley Warren was a dangerous maniac. Your uncle met him in the trenches in the First World War, and they worked together in the 20s. Whatever may have happened, whatever should happen, be very careful around Warren. I found this note. He must have forgotten to give it to you. Leave the book with me. Will you need it for long? Come back tomorrow. I'll have the note deciphered by then. You're not dreaming. I'm back.
I have often wondered if the majority of mankind ever paused to reflect upon the occasionally titanic significance of dreams and the obscure world to which they belong. Whilst the greater number of our nocturnal visions are perhaps no more than faint and fantastic visions of our daily existence, there are still a certain remainder whose mundane and ethereal character permit no ordinary interpretation, and whose vaguely disquieting effect suggests possible minute glimpses into a sphere of mental existence no less important than that of physical life, yet separated from that life by an all but impassable barrier. Professor? is not dead which can eternal lie and with strange eons even death may die as I have said before the weird studies of Harley Warren were well known to me and to some extent shared by 
of his vast collection of strange, rare books on forbidden subjects, I have read all that are in the languages of which I am master. But these are few as compared to those in languages I cannot understand. Most, I believe, are in Arabic, and the fiend-inspired book which brought on the end was written in characters whose like I never saw elsewhere. And my friend always refused to reveal its meaning. I remember how I shuddered at his facial expression on the night of the awful happening, when he talked so incessantly of his theory, why certain corpses never decay, but rest firm and fat in their tombs for a thousand years. cemetery, so ancient that I trembled at the manifold signs of immemorial years. two places at the same time. Come on, George. We've got a lot of work to do before dawn. What's the matter with you? There's nothing to be afraid of. Of all people. You should know that's not true. Listen, if you want to give up, I won't hold it against you, but I have to do this tonight. I can't go back. The ideal conditions won't arise again for another 200 years. You won't make it. Well, if I don't, you'll know what to do. In the last months, I had watched helplessly as Warren's obsession with the Necronomicon quickly exceeded the boundaries of reason. Though I wished to stop him, the power of the book itself drew me ever closer to the final step. My goal is almost in sight, you know. I've mastered the formulas, but one element is missing. It's in the book. We must find the book. Did I tell you? Last week, I kept one of them alive for more than three hours. But he was old, unstable. Imagine the day when they talk to me. I've got a fragment of verse 30, but I need the passage specifying its exact pronunciation. I've neglected the subtleties, and that's what provoked the dissolution. You can't imagine how fast they putrefy at that stage. I still don't understand. Why do you want to do this out here? Let's just get the book and go back to the lab. The lab? This isn't some kitchen sink amputation. A strictly clinical approach will fail. Why can't you understand that? We must know the ancient words. We must learn the incantation. True science is here. You can't dream of a better laboratory. The accounts are true. This is the one. It'll give.
What about me? I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to stay on the surface. What we've done thus far has nothing on this. It's fiendish work. And I doubt that any man without ironclad sensibilities could go through it and come up alive and sane. Here, with this phone, you'll be able to keep a track of all my movements. I'm coming with you. No. If something happens to me, you'll be able to carry on with our work. All right. Good luck. You may guess that in dreams life, matter and vitality, as the earth knows such things, may not be constant, and that time and space does not exist as our waking selves comprehend them. Sometimes I believe that this less material life is our truer life, and that our vain existence on earth is itself the secondary and merely virtual phenomenon.
My. It's H.P. Lovecraft. Yes. What am I doing on your shirt? <laughs> It's difficult to explain. Please, try. I think you're dreaming. No. I'm the one who's dreaming. Yes. It is possible. Just a moment. Wait. Wait. Here we are. All life is only a set of pictures in the brain, among which there is no difference between those barn of real things and those barn of inward dreaming. I wrote this yesterday. You have a name, I suppose? Randolph. Carter. Yes, of course. One of my characters. Randolph Carter, the traveler in the world of dreams. Yes. Yes. I am a writer. An amateur, but a writer still. I know. You know? It is not often that I meet one of my readers. There are so few and far between. Where I come from, you've got quite a following. Enough to print your picture on a shirt. How peculiar. I'm surely dreaming. Mr. Carter, my old aunt makes an excellent lemonade. Something to freshen our ideas. We live, she and I, only a few miles from here. Let's walk together. All right. Who knows? Perhaps in the meantime, one of us will wake up in his own home, his own bed, desperately trying to remember his dream. It is now clear to me that any literary merit I have is confined to dream life. Strange shadows, cosmic outsideness. I have no illusions concerning the precarious status of my tales and do not expect to become a serious competitor of my favorite weird authors. Poe, Arthur Mackin, Dunsany. The only thing I can say in favor of my work is its sincerity. I refuse to follow the mechanical conventions of popular fiction, to fill my tales with stock characters and situations, but insist on reproducing real moods and impressions the best way I command. The result may be poor, But I'd rather keep aiming at serious literary expression than accept the artificial standards of cheap romance. Last winter I had a strange visit. Uh, two men, dressed in black, came to see me. I'd never seen them before either. <laughs> With all the seriousness in the world, they asked me questions about the Necronomicon. They wanted to know how I learned about the book. And when I told them I'd imagined it, They suddenly left, with no explanation. Maybe you guessed the existence of the Necronomicon before others actually discovered it. No one will actually discover the Necronomicon, Mr. Carter. It exists only because I imagined it. Oh, it exists. Does it really? I have a copy. Do you? Yeah. Well, let us just say that in order for a thing to exist, it only has to be imagined. Okay. What do you think of this? There's an idea I have for a novel. The mirror. Are you all right, Mr. Carter? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just a little dizzy. Imagine an aging alchemist who has devoted his entire life to communicating with monstrous creatures from another world. Now, he falls ill and learns he will die. And having lost all hope of finishing his fiendish work, he manages to predict the day in which he will return to the living. Do you believe in reincarnation? No, I don't believe in anything at all, you know. Reincarnation is pure superstition. But it is an excellent pretext for a story. <laughs> Now, this alchemist knows that his new incarnation will remember nothing of his former life, so he imagines leaving behind a key 
to his memory, the Necronomicon. Now, reading this book will open the door to dreams through which his ancestral spirit will return and take possession of his nephew's body. Mr. Carter? dreaming. You pronounced the ancient words. You called me back. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> Yes, Aunt Annie. I heard laughter. Yes. I was dreaming. I must have talked in my sleep. Another nightmare. Yes. A magnificent nightmare. Go to bed, Aunt Annie. Everything's fine. I think I'll write for a while. How arrogant of us, creatures of the moment, whose very species is but an experiment in Deus Naturae, to arrogate to ourselves an immortal future and considerable status. How do we know that that form of atomic and molecular motion called life is the highest of all forms? Perhaps the dominant creature, the most rational and godlike of all beings, is an invisible gas. Personally, I should not care for immortality in the least. There is nothing better than oblivion, since in oblivion there is no wish unfulfilled. We had it before we were born, yet did not complain. Shall we then whine because we know it will return? The mammals, of which man is part, are simply a psychochemical phenomenon, a component of carbon animated by a form of electric energy. This energy disappears, and the body disintegrates. Everything is finished. 